Well, this new ban will not affect private companies or our use of facial recognition software on our cell phones, using it, for example, to unlock your phone or to tag your friends on Facebook. It will, however, affect county agencies, and supporters say that is a big win for civil rights as well as our privacy. This is amazing news. Community groups are ecstatic about the groundbreaking ban on facial recognition software. We're really happy as, as immigrants that have been targeted by immigration enforcement, as people of color. Maru Mora Villapando is with Latino Advocacy. She joined a coalition of groups to get King County Council to vote for the ban. We texted, we mailed, we tweeted. We're really afraid of already the power that ICE and police has. And giving them, the, giving them this kind of technologies, it makes us more afraid. So we think that the county did the right thing. Aye, Council Member Dunn. Aye. Council Member Dunn votes aye. Council Member Colwell. Aye. King County Council voted unanimously to prevent government agencies from using the powerful tool in King County. It's now the first multi-city county that's implementing the ban. It's great that the King County Council has taken this step to uh, hit the pause button on these technologies. Those worried about facial recognition software say blacks, Latinos and Asians are often misidentified by the software. We now know of at least three black men who have been wrongfully arrested and jailed due to racially biased face recognition technology. So this really powerful surveillance tool will inevitably exacerbate already racially biased policing. Yeah. County Council member Jeannie Cole Wells says her proposal protects civil rights. It bans the use of the software by county agencies, including King County Sheriff's Office. Absolutely have to protect the privacy of our citizens. And the moment that we uh, stop doing that is the moment that we live in a dystopia like uh, Minority Report or 1984. And Eric, when we got out here today, we saw a sex worker come right out of this encampment, half naked. That happening while well, children were playing just right up on the playground. The homeless encampment behind Broadview Thompson K through 8 continues to grow, causing more concern for parents, teachers, and neighbors. They need to do something about it before a really violent incident happens. On May 21st, the new interim superintendent Brent Jones sent Mayor Jenny Dirk in a letter that says in part, Seattle Public Schools needs to remove this encampment from its property and is reaching out to encampment residents in the community to determine what supports could be provided to encampment residents to help them access better choices for shelter and housing. The letter goes on to say it is not realistic for the district to develop on its own a comprehensive program of support for the unsheltered community. This is what Mayor Jenny Durkin told us late last week. So we've had a long, robust conversation with the school district. Um, they're a billion dollar organization with funds and resources. The mayor says the city is working with the district to do what she calls stand up their own process. I hope that they are able to take that approach. I mean, I think that if they follow what we've been able to do in many places using and city properties and city resources, that you can have a very compassionate based outreach. The encampment has been a hotbed of criminal activity and parents want the unhoused moved to another location or into shelter. People have needs that should be addressed. With just a few weeks left of school, the community is calling on the district to do something that improves safety here for all. I know they care passionately. They're working to do it. Um, and so we're working with them to see if we can help them um, stand up a process similar to ours. And back out here live, what exactly that process looks like for the district they have not yet shared with us. But we do know this neighborhood has been impacted, that is, by increased property crimes, fires, drug use, and prostitution. I also want to let you know that just across the way here at the Bitter Lake Community Center, the city has now stationed a security guard during daylight hours. Live in Bitter Lake tonight, I'm Kara Kostinich, Como News. Kara, thank you very much. Kara's been tracking this story since March as more parents voiced their concerns about the 40 tent encampment. In April, the tents remained in place as students returned to in-person learning. The district reached out to the city for help in mid-April and teachers sent a letter to the district at the end of May. If you have questions about an encampment in the city of Seattle, you can reach out to our Project Seattle team by calling this number, 206-404-4732, or email projectseattle at comonews.com.
COVID-19 restrictions now face an organized resistance in Bonnie Lake. City leaders there just banned any requirements that have people proving their vaccination status to enter a local business. Camos Joel Marino is live in Bonnie Lake with the potential impacts of this resolution. Joel? Uh, Mary, the city resolution does not supersede state rules, so businesses, they could still be fine for violating the updated mask or vaccination policies, but it does send a message that Bonnie Lake won't stand for segregation that's based on whether a person got their shots or not. Updated masking rules are more than just confusing for some. In Bonnie Lake, city leaders say the added burden on business is simply wrong. Now we're, asked, we're saying then you can... You can open, but you got to card people if they want to take their masks off. And we're saying that's just not right. Under the new state rules, fully vaccinated employees no longer need to mask up or even socially distance. However, employers need to first verify that workers actually got their shots. Some businesses can also expand seating limits, but only if they're filled with fully vaccinated customers. And that was a, a line in the sand that we at, in Bonnie Lake were just not going to not going to stand. You're actually having discrimination based on vaccination status where you're having people, you know, if you're vaccinated, you sit here. And if you're not vaccinated, you sit there. State Senator Phil Fortunato plans to call for a special legislative session this summer to address the new COVID-19 protocols, which he says are unworkable and divisive. Fortunato says Bonnie Lake has set the example where city leaders won't tolerate the segregation of people based on their vaccination status. It's time to stop regulating each other and being afraid and do what's best for you and do what's best for your business and your employees without being mandated by the state. Council member Angela Ishmael says that Bonnie Lake is the first city in Washington to issue this type of ban against pandemic restrictions, and she hopes that other cities will follow the lead. Back to you. And tonight, a spokesperson for the governor's office says there's plenty of leeway in the new rules, but some standards must be followed. Employers are required to keep workplaces free from hazards that can cause injury or death. COVID-19 remains a threat, and unvaccinated people are especially at risk. Employers have options, and if they don't want to verify status, they can continue masking and social distancing. Here's a live... Hi, everyone. Hi everybody, I'm Preston Phillips from Como News. Thanks for checking out, for checking out the Como page. YouTube channel. You can see Shannon more of our videos right here by clicking on the video links for more news from the Seattle area and Western Washington. Oh, and don't forget to click the subscribe button below so you don't miss our YouTube updates.